Hello and welcome to the Wildfire Mitigation Alignment Webinar. My name is Frank Freebelt. I'm the Director of the Wildland Urban Interface Fire Institute at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, and I'll be your moderator this afternoon. I want to quickly recognize our hosts uh, for this afternoon, California League of Cities, the Rural Counties Representatives of California, the California State Association of Counties, and in addition, we'd like to thank you for the day's uh, presenters, CAL FIRE, the State Fire Marshal's Office. This afternoon's webinar will last about an hour and a half. We'll have about an hour of presentations and ideally around 30 minutes of uh, Q&A for you to participate in. Um, should you encounter any issues, please do not hesitate to reach out to uh, Kara Garrett. She should have this information in the chat shortly uh, with her phone number there and her uh, email as well. Before engaging our, our panelists this afternoon, um, I want to lay a foundation with a couple of couple of comments uh, as we enter into this discussion. The uh, the the futures that we're looking at, there are none of them that don't involve more smoke and fire, and that may be a little disconcerting. But if we're going to follow the science, uh, and we look at what's happening in in global warming in the atmosphere we're gonna have more smoke and fire. Our biggest contributions to influencing that are gonna be about intensity. Can we try to get more beneficial fire on the landscape at scale, but at lower intensity? A second one that I would like to, to leave with you is that we're responding to actual and projected conflagration levels of life and property loss. We had wildfire for many, many years, thousands of years. But it's really only recently that we've started losing um, conflagration levels of life and property to wildfire. And so when we have discussions like, like this, when we're wrestling with the policies that you are in your workspaces, it really is about those losses. And I would just like to offer that we can't suppress, regulate, or market price our way out of this, especially in the built environment we simply have to mitigate. That, that is our path forward. We'll need those other strategies, but they have to be, they can't be our predominant go-to policies and strategies. They need to be uh, led by mitigation and then supplemented with those, those other three. The good news is we've solved wicked problems before um, in my career. Uh, I started in 1979. We've watched uh, the ability for fires to move out of the room and origin really slipped to not zero, but very, very small. And that's through decades of uh, good code, good enforcement and good science. And so we can do this. We just have to decide that we're, we're ready to and look at it for the long game and look at it through especially good regulation, um, good code, good education, and just settle in for the long term. This, this is not going to be a, uh, a short effort for us. It's going to take decades. I think it's important that we, we align key stakeholders in this discussion. Um, one of my first real revelations in this, not all that long ago, was in a single week, I had uh, approved a defensible space inspection by a couple, company, a couple that had done a, a great job on their property. Uh, and then during the same week, they had a notice of non-renewal uh, for their insurance. And we have to give our property owners a more aligned view of what the right mitigations are and what they need to be accomplishing um, on their property. I think another item that we have to think about, especially as public leaders, is we need to be guiding our, our communities through really it's a grieving process. Um, the future for us, especially during the last decade, is looking a lot different than we thought it did before that decade. Um, we're near certain that we're gonna have changes in our future related to climate and we're grieving that. And you can probably imagine some of those steps in your own communities. There's outright denial um, as we, we see some of the communities that just disappear in an afternoon. Um, there's certainly anger, bargaining. Um, and there can be some depression and just not sure what to do, but we, or in leadership positions and we need to provide guidance on that. So um, 
we need to help get our communities to acceptance on what's coming, and then we can get busy about the, the business that we need to do. And lastly, I would just say we need to broaden our kind of transactional approach to wildfire mitigation. Um, a lot of the discussions I hear right now are, well, if I do this, how much will I save? And I really think we need to, we need to reframe that thinking towards, if I don't do this, how much is it going to cost? And not just to ourselves as individuals, but to our communities. Um, our rural communities burn as systems, and we need to we need to mitigate them as systems. So, um, with those as kind of a, a background and foundation, um, I'd like to introduce you to um, our first panelist. This is the State Fire Marshal Chief Berlant. Um, he's going to discuss California's investment on wildfire mitigation and statewide alignment. Chief Berlant began his career with CAL FIRE in 2001 and moved up the ranks to his current role as State Fire Marshal. He was appointed to the position by the governor in 2023, where he leads the state's efforts in fire prevention, including wildfire preparedness. Chief Berlant. Well, uh, let me just start off by thanking all of you for uh, joining us today. Uh, for really such an important topic. I think uh, Frank really set the stage um, really well. But I also thank uh, our panelists that you'll be hearing from from each uh, one here shortly, just because there is um, you know, a, a broad, diverse group uh, of education and knowledge on this topic. But I think, and I hope, that the message that you'll be hearing from all, each of us is just how hard we've all worked to align uh, you know, these messages and, and this work. Uh, let me just start off with a little bit of, of uh, setting the stage uh, for California's wildfire problem. Uh, in, in really, in less than a decade, California has experienced its largest, its most destructive, and even its deadliest wildfires. Our dry Mediterranean climate really has always lent itself naturally uh, to wildfires, but more recently, a confluence of issues that you see here on the screen have led to an immense wildfire crisis. Now, I'm not gonna go into detail on, on each of these, uh, and each one plays uh, its own level of, of its factor and the politics, um, the challenges that come with each one of them. But broadly, uh, our, our, our climate is changing. Uh, we're experiencing record hot temperatures here in California. We're seeing more frequent uh, and extended heat waves, longer summer months. Uh, our forests, they're overcrowded. Uh, drought has left trees susceptible to disease uh, and insects uh, like bark beetle. And that's left well over 100 million dead trees uh, within the past decade. Now, 95% of our wildfires, at least in Cal Fire's jurisdiction, uh, are caused by the activity of people. And so the human ignitions of these wildfires has also uh, been on an increase. And this ranges from negligence uh, to arson to utility power lines. And then lastly, uh, contributing to this problem is, is just our growth. La uh, from 2010 to 2020, California's population grew by nearly 6%. Uh, that's over 2.4 million people, more people, uh, bringing California over to 39 million people within our state. And well over 11 million uh, of those people, including myself and many of our panelists, live within the wildland urban interface. Now, despite the complexities of these challenges, uh, the politics uh, behind many of those factors that I just mentioned, in California, I believe we have a very strong strategy as far as protecting our communities and really starting to address uh, the concern. Our roadmap comes from the state's Wildfire and Forest Resilience Task Force, which is a collaboration of state, federal, local, and even tribal uh, entities all working together uh, in, in really these core, three core areas that you see here on the screen. The first one is parcel level mitigations. This is vegetation removal, defensible space uh, in and around uh, homes, uh, building and retrofitting homes uh, with ember ignition uh, resistant materials. So that's really the parcel uh, level. The next one is community hardening. Uh, this is land use planning, design standards uh, for developing new neighborhoods, building fuel breaks in and around communities, uh, reducing the overgrown vegetation that we have near roadways and evacuation routes. And then this last uh, element of the strategy is restoring really at landscape level, our ecosystems, removing the overcrowding in our forests that I mentioned earlier, putting prescribed fire back uh, on the ground. I like to uh, use this kind of uh, circular um, uh, graphic because it really shows that there's not one solution. 
So in our strategy here in California, we really believe that we have to do all of these. All of them uh, are played an equal uh, or a, a connected part of, of, the, of the challenge. And so we have to be working on all of them. And, and in this uh, circular image, it really is kind of this nested approach where you have the, the homes, our individual properties right in the center. You have the community and those community-based mitigations that I talked about, the wildland urban interface uh, in that, that, that center circle. And then lastly, that outer ring, which is the forest. Again, those are the landscape scale uh, efforts. I'm really gonna be talking about for, for uh, my portion of the state's efforts, really those, those two inner circles. But the point here is that our strategy in California really uh, encompasses all three of these uh, circles as, a, as an interconnection. Now, I, I have to uh, note that in the wake of wildfires of 2018, 2020, and 2021, California has made unprecedented investments in wildfire resiliency. To carry out these programs, we've surged our funding from roughly $200 million, uh, of what we were receiving uh, uh, in about 2019 upwards to $2.6 billion uh, in just the past several years. Uh, so a significant investment in these three core uh, areas. Now, obviously, uh, you know, it, it doesn't go without saying right now that the state is uh, facing uh, a revenue shortfall. And so how the state continues to manage uh, these programs is going to be a challenge that we look forward um, to addressing in the in the, the coming years. But the point is we've made significant one time fundings and ongoing uh, funding uh, in wildfire resiliency, and not just at my agency, not just CAL FIRE, but really spread out across 22 uh, other state departments um, that have brought uh, this funding to bear on the ground in over 550 uh, different projects. And if 2022 demonstrated anything to us, it's that when we invest in resiliency at scale, uh, even with the continuing uh, extreme climate conditions, we can see uh, results. To achieve community resiliency, it's a systems approach. Just like I mentioned, we have to really make sure that we go from parcel to community to forest, all interconnected. When we dive just into the community, it's not just one thing. There are a number of things that all work together. So in addition to fire protection, uh, it takes all these steps assembled together to really give us a, a fighting chance of preparing our communities to withstand wildfires. Again, wildfires that are natural in California's climate. Now, some of these are the responsibility of homeowners. Uh, some of them are for our community planners, our developers, our builders, um, but even our private partners like our electrical uh, utility uh, companies all play a role. But really, again, to truly be prepared for our communities, we have to have broad agreement uh, and alignment in the strategies across all stakeholders, not just the fire departments, not just the state telling us what we need to do. It has to be across all um, sectors. As I mentioned at the top, our progress uh, that we've been making really uh, is uh, with the, the collaboration of the Wildfire and Forest Resilience Task Force, which is a multi-government and, and tribal uh, organization. But in our efforts to prepare our communities, we've really taken uh, this coordination to, to uh, the next step. And, and that, again, is bringing all levels of government as well as non-government organizations together to communicate and align the work that we are doing uh, here at Cal Fire Office State Fire Marshal, we hold uh, monthly meetings. Several of the panelists you'll hear from uh, sit on, on this committee, but we have a Wildfire Mitigation Advisory Committee um, where we're not only providing updates on the efforts that are uh, programs and initiatives that are underway in, under our office uh, and department, uh, but also we work to get input to make sure that the work we are doing has uh, valuable input from, from our stakeholders. In addition, at these meetings, we hear from our uh, 19 member organizations uh, spending time at each meeting uh, to receive various presentations on the latest wildfire uh, mitigations related to research projects uh, and hot topics. Uh, this group meets uh, the third Tuesday of every month uh, at one o'clock uh, here in Sacramento. But for those of you at home or in your office, uh, it, is, um, it is a hybrid meeting. And so you are always welcome to join us. Just listen in on, on what's happening, again, not just with CAL FIRE, uh, but with all of our, uh, our partner organizations. Now, a lot of science and research has gone into the mitigations the state is, is requiring. Uh, you're going to probably hear other references uh, to the Institute uh, for Business and Home Safety, but uh, this picture and this image here uh, is, is their state-of-the-art ember production and wind tunnel facility uh, that can recreate hurricane-level winds uh, while um, sending embers, as you can see from, from this photo, again, recreating a, a wildfire. 
Uh, in this video that, that uh, I'm sharing now, it shows you how they took highly realistic wildfire simulations to really explore how embers ignite structures. Uh, researchers concluded that embers accumulated typically within the five feet of a building. So this finding has led to uh, new state requirements that are currently being developed by the Board of Forestry and Fire Protection. Uh, and they're working to prohibit plants, vegetation, and other flammable items within that first five feet uh, of the structures for those homes uh, within wildland urban interface areas. As you can see from this video, uh, the, the home is caught on fire, but this is one that is not built to our Chapter 7A, our building code standards. It does not have the vegetation defensible space requirements of this zero to five feet. Uh, but the image uh, that was next to it here, you go uh, on the right, you can see did not really sustain any damage. It is built to uh, our standard. There is no vegetation right up to it. And so really uh, I talk about this research because uh, it's informing our building code here in California. Uh, and we'll continue to partner with many researchers to make sure that the latest available science is embedded into the mitigations uh, that we are requiring. Now, since 2008, we've had some of the most stringent building codes uh, really in the world for new homes built in wildfire prone areas. But our challenge in California is that about 90% of the homes were built prior to these the current WUI codes, which took an effect 2008. So our challenge really is how do we bring uh, the nearly 10 million homes that were built before this code and retrofit them or harden them against embers uh, and the flames of wildfires. And this term, uh, we often like to use uh, the, the term home hardening. So we, uh, to help us with that, we've created a low cost retrofit list to assist homeowners uh, in knowing what important retrofits can they do at their home that will make a meaningful difference. Some of these with no money, uh, no permit, no contractor. I won't lie to you, some of them are difficult. Uh, you know, if you need to replace a roof, that can cost you tens of thousands of dollars, but the research shows that really 99% of uh, homes in California already have uh, a WUI uh, compliant roof. And so that uh, the cost should not be the immediate barrier um, to getting this work done. But the big challenge for us is how do we get the work done for those who can't afford to do the work or maybe who can't physically uh, do the work? So over the last couple of years, we've collaborated with Cal OES uh, to answer that question by developing a financial assistance retrofit program. Uh, the program is being piloted in six communities where we're working to leverage uh, FEMA hazard mitigation funds to provide somewhere in the ballpark of about $40,000 per home for prioritized home hardening and defensible space efforts. But as I talked about community-based mitigations, uh, we can't just harden one home here and one harden home there. Part of this pilot is how do we get the entire community hardened? Again, whether it is through uh, financial assistance or whether it's through other incentives or education, we have to get the entire neighborhood um, to, be, to be hardened. And that kind of segues us into community-wide mitigation. Um, our, our research really has shown us uh, that, uh, uh, that based on density, if one home has partial level mitigations and the next door does not, both homes are still at risk. So whether it's through a fire safe council, firewise communities, or other neighborhood level groups, community led organizations uh, are an integral part in ensuring that we move beyond just focusing on the partial and focusing on the individual and, and take a step back and make sure that we have community wide uh, mitigations. Now, our team is very proud that we have helped um, locals surge the number of firewise uh, communities in California that are in good standing um, to just under 800. We lead the nation in firewise communities. It's really an education uh, program. It's not necessarily a validation of the work, but it is a, a really good step to getting 800 communities uh, knowledgeable and educated of, of their dangers and the steps they can do to mitigate them. Uh, but another recent success that we have is a project that we funded through the California Fire Safe Council, uh, where we've been able to staff a wildfire mitigation coordinator in nearly every single county. Uh, this position is a vital link in connecting the actions the state is doing with local grassroots efforts um, and providing them the capacity to successfully access funding uh, for, more importantly, uh, to get the, the critical projects implemented uh, on the ground. To help communities plan for future development, uh, we have a whole team of wildfire mitigation experts made up of experienced fire captains and battalion chiefs that provide technical assistance to local governments, whether it's updating their safety element, whether it's becoming a community wildfire or developing a community wildfire protection plan or getting that firewise uh, status. This team is there really solely to help locals uh, comply and, and incorporate wildfire best practices.
And in addition, we recently began offering a land use planning for wildfires uh, course where we're teaching local planners, building officials, and fire officials the foundational elements uh, in fire hazard uh, areas. So as I wrap up and I show you this uh, beautiful view that I like to use uh, in my presentations of Yosemite, uh, it's a view that is clear of wildfire smoke. Uh, it's got a healthy forest just outside the the photo has a, a prepared uh, neighborhood and community just outside the park. But to ensure that we have this view for our kids and into the future, we have to continue this tiered approach, ecosystem restoration, community hardening, and partial level mitigations. And each year, it seems like we break uh, records uh, for the most destructive and the most damaging wildfires. Uh, and really, measuring success is not easy. Uh, I could probably continue to rattle off some stats for all of you, um, but all of you know that, uh, and, and at least those of us in the in the fire professions know, the hardest part in fire prevention is quantifying something that you prevented from ever happening. Uh, but I'm confident that in 2022 and 2023, we've demonstrated that when, again, we invest in community resiliency at that scale, large scale, we can actually see uh, results. So really with the efforts that are happening today, I believe our trajectory for wildfire destruction uh, is being uh, recalibrated. With that, um, here's some links uh, you can scan while I uh, pass it back to, to Frank, um, but it's some more educational information and programmatic information on um, our various programs uh, and services. So Frank, thank you. All right, next up we have Chief Dave Winokur. Uh, he is the fire chief for the Moraga Renda Fire Protection District. Um, he also leads the California Fire Chiefs Association Wildland Urban Interface WUI Task Force. Uh, and he is also um, a veteran fellow at the Hoover Institute studying the intersection of wildfire loss and insurance. Chief Winokur. Hey, good afternoon. I appreciate the opportunity to share my perspective as a local government fire chief and representing the California Fire Chiefs Association. One of the important intersections that is not well understood is the interplay between local government and CAL FIRE. Local government often is where the rubber meets the road with regard to the responsibility for the prevention and suppression of fires in and around structures. Obviously, this has to be nested with the landscape and ecosystem level efforts undertaken by CAL FIRE. But it is the local government where we see the greatest challenges with encouraging homeowners to carry out the defensible space and home hardening retrofits that will not only protect their homes and their property, but the neighbors and the community level loss that we've been experiencing recently. To start with a discussion of why we are here, it's important to recognize that California is not only a fire prone landscape, but is a fire dependent landscape. And it's the exclusion of wildfire from our landscape that was a contributing factor to where we have been with the recent losses. If you read any of the early accounts from the initial explorers or the studies that have been done by various academic partners, there are between four and six million acres per year burned in California before European arrival and development. It's important to recognize that in some of the recent fire years, 2017, 2018, 2020, and 2021, where we use words like unprecedented and catastrophic and new normal, it was just the old normal, but it's back again. Because in those years, we hit the lower end of the historical range. And it's critical to recognize that any future where we are in balance with our environment is going to include wildfire. If you're in a grass and brush covered area like our Mediterranean counties, there is a fire return interval between three and five years in the grass and brush fuel models. In the forest, it's a little longer, 15 to 25 years, depending on the area. But it's important to recognize that that fire return interval, which is nature's way of maintaining balance and equilibrium, when we disrupt that, we allow the accumulation of combustible fuels that will support fast moving and destructive wildfire. And at the same time that we excluded wildfire and we allowed this accumulated deficit of fuels to build up, really a, a payment that we have deferred that is now coming due, we've built almost 3 million homes with as many as 11 million residents in those areas. They create an imperative to put fires out quickly if they are not in communities that are fire adapted or resilient and able to withstand contact with fire, either being in or adjacent to a fire perimeter without the probability of loss. And it is the steps that Chief Berlant talked about and the other panelists will talk about that are critical to creating fire adapted and resilient communities. And lastly, this is not a climate change issue per se. Climate change is a contributing factor, but that contribution is primarily to the compression of the historical rainy season, meaning we are exposed to more of 
the high wind, dry, low RH days in the fall, that typically many of those occurred after the onset of seasonal rain. And with disruption of rain patterns and other weather systems associated with climate change, we are exposed to more of those as we move into a hotter, drier future in which more of our fires will occur on days that are capable of, crit of, crit of supporting critical fire spread and high fire intensity. And I offer up this, this particular shot of an academic paper from 2007 to say, this is not new. We understand that this is a fire dependent landscape. Just for too long, we used a suppression first approach that allowed us to ignore the underlying realities of this environment. And there is no future in which we will suppress or price our way out of this alone. It is the, the presence or absence of mitigation and the execution of pre-fire measures at scale that will create fire adapted communities. So the way that works, if we look back at Jack Cohn's groundbreaking work where he described the Wooey fire disaster sequence, it is that fire suppression is effective up until the moment that the quantity, intensity, and speed of the fire exceeds resources. As in, very simplistically, there is more fire than firefighters at the point of entry, meaning that the relative speed of the fire has outpaced the speed of the firefighting response. And we gain control of fires from that point when conditions improve. And conditions can improve when the wind stops or the fire reaches an area that lacks the continuity of fuels that will support rapid fire spread. Pre-fire work in the form of fire prevention improves those conditions by reducing the prevalence of receptive fuel beds and the horizontal and vertical continuity of those fuels that will allow fire spread at rapid rates. Fire cannot spread without a substrate of fuel. And when fire does not have the conditions that will support its spread, quite simply, it does not spread. And that means that we will have fewer losses in the values at risk because our firefighting resources will be able to stay ahead of the fire spread curve. All of that is achieved at the most building block basis through parcel level mitigations. And prevention in the form of parcel mitigations is low cost, it has high impact, and there are few barriers to execution. Removing the vegetation in zone zero within five feet of a structure, low cost, high impact. Trimming and limbing vegetation out in zone one from five to 30 feet, and then again from 30 feet to 100 feet with reduction in the level of mitigations the farther one moves from the home, low cost, high impact. Clearing out ground fuels, removing low hanging branches, clearing out decadent and dead vegetation. All of these things can reduce the risk and the firefighting response can address the residual risk where fire does things that was not, was not expected or is working its way through these areas where mitigation has slowed the rate of spread that fire is going to move. Here we see a simulation of a fire start within the Moraga Arinda Fire Protection District. And you note that very quickly, the ignition point shown in yellow in the middle right of the, of the screen, the ignition point produces a fire that then through wind-driven embers that travel far in advance of the main body of fire, starts additional downwind spot fires, some of which grow to a larger size than the original fire itself. And it just speaks to the need to have mitigations at depth because linear measures such as fuel breaks or a single line of defensible space at the point of transition of a vegetative fire into the built environment can quickly be overwhelmed by flying embers traveling miles in advance, which is why we need to be thoughtful about our mitigations. And we need to view this as a network, a systems approach where every community is made up of a series of small parcels, each of which contributes either to the survivability or the vulnerability of that community. These, can be, these measures can be achieved through a number of steps. From out to in, those look like fuel breaks, which are linear defensible areas where fuel has been reduced so that the intensity of fire is slowed from which firefighters can make a stand, or, strat or splats, strategically placed local area treatments along fire pathways can disrupt the, feed, the speed of the fire spread, roadside fuel reduction efforts, which build upon the non-burnable nature of a road, a fire break, if you will, and, and have the ancillary benefit of establishing secure evacuation routes and routes through which we can aggregate the effective firefighting response. Then as we move closer to the community, looking at wooey fuel reduction zones or really extended defensible space, moving from 100 feet from the home out to two to 300 feet in areas where we want to reduce the intensity and slow the speed of the fire before it enters the built environment. And then defensible space with a, very, with a high emphasis on zone zero, that area within five feet of the structure in which the science says very clearly, there should be nothing that will burn. And as Chief Berlant mentioned, thoughtful home hardening retrofits for older construction that was not built to the 7A ember resistant standard with an emphasis on replacing vents 
and keeping the roof and the gutters clear of, uh, of combustive material. And lastly, an integrated WUI response, our wildland urban interface suppression response, whereby we're responding firefighters, hand crews, bulldozers, aircraft, et cetera, to pick up the fire that has made it through all of these treatments, most of which are designed to slow, not stop the fire spread. All of this is well understood. The science is well established. We just need to execute. And that is where we are currently struggling is widespread implementation of these measures on community-wide basis because a single home carrying out these mitigations, if there are other homes within 50 to 100 feet of it, these mitigations can be overwhelmed by the conditions on non-mitigated adjacent parcel. And the great challenge here is that fire, managed fire, prescribed fire is our best tool in returning ourselves to a, a fire adapted state. Fire as a tool is most beneficial when it's executed in close proximity to homes. Here's a, an example of a recent prescribed fire project carried out by Contra Costa County Fire, MOFD and CAL FIRE in close proximity to homes at the point of transition where we see the combination of topography of weather and fuels that could bring fire into this community rapidly, clearing out this thatch in order to set conditions for the return of grazing. It's an excellent tool to not only set conditions for sustainment, but to sustain it in out years through the use of the ruminants. Here's another example of using fire to clear out an overgrown parcel, setting conditions to reestablish grazing. And a last example of the need to not only set conditions for grazing by clearing out thatch, but push back the encroaching brush that is moving into these grasslands due to the exclusion of fire. A cheaper lance shared with the video, there is very simple difference between the left side of this home and the right side. And the primary contributing factor to the outcome that the left side of this home is experiencing is the presence of combustible mulch in zone zero. Without that fuel bed to establish fire, the home is much less likely to burn. We need to rapidly move ourselves as a community, as a state, as a neighborhood, and as a parcel to being more like the right side of this home with thoughtful landscaping choices and some low cost, high impact home hardening retrofits. All of this is outlined in clear actuarial science by good work done through the Casualty Actuarial Society by CoreLogic and Milliman. Uh, I would encourage everyone to look up these reports that are cited here that give specific and quantifiable outcomes for the implementation of mitigations at the parcel level and then again at the community level. As an example from that second report, the Paradise Task 1 through 4, on the left side, we see a recommendation for a series of buffers around the community. And on the right side, we see a baseline of average annual loss for every $1 million in total insured value, showing that there are significant portions of the community of Paradise that in the current state have a high exposure to wildfire risk as measured in average annual loss. And here we see a number of future states, and I would call your attention to the top left, which is what the community will, be, will look like with regard to AAL in 2040 if nothing else is done. So in a hotter, drier future, it is clear that conditions get worse. But if we look at the bottom two slides, where we see a significant reduction in average annual loss through the execution of thoughtful mitigations, we can clearly see the way that low cost, high impact treatments maintained over time can reduce the community's risk and the valuation of that risk in the long term. Now with that, I thank you for the opportunity and turn it back over to Phil. Thank you, Chief. Next, we have Deborah Halberstadt with the California Department of Insurance to discuss Safer from Wildfires framework. Deborah is the newly appointed special advisor to the Insurance Commissioner on Biodiversity and Inclusive Insurance. Deborah has worked at the forefront of climate law and policy in California, including as a senior climate, climate policy advisor to the Department of Insurance, Deputy Secretary for Coastal and Ocean Policy with the California Natural Resources Agency, Executive Director of the California Ocean Protection Council, and as Deputy Attorney General in the Environment and Laws, Land Law sections of the Department of Justice. In her current role, she advocates for innovative solutions to the threats posed by biodiversity loss and climate change and catalyzes change through partnerships and collaboration. Deborah?
Good afternoon. Thank you so much for, for having me. Um, I have a couple of introductory remarks and then I will um, switch over to the slideshow um, to, as a visual aid to the presentation. So Insurance Commissioner Lara is the regulator for insurance markets in California, which is the fourth largest insurance market in the world. And the overarching approach that Commissioner Lara has taken on addressing the challenges posed by climate intensified wildfires um, has been to continue to prioritize risk reduction um, to California communities. The department has focused on multi-year efforts, engaging with consumers and stakeholders as it assesses how new tools can improve risk management and make commercial and residential insurance more accessible and more reliable for Californians, while at the same time maintaining um, competition, maintaining competition and ensuring stability in the state's insurance marketplace. The department has been very clear that benefits to consumers are of utmost importance as we strive to increase the availability of reliable insurance from the admitted market and ensure the long-term stability of rates and also incentivize the accurate recognition of wildfire mitigation efforts. Uh, so today, the, um, the focus of my testimony will be the Commissioner's Safer from Wildfires framework. This framework is a collaboration among the state's wildfire preparedness agencies to communicate home hardening and community mitigation actions to Californians. And I particularly appreciate the hard work and the partnership with CAL FIRE um, in aligning the work of different state agencies to reduce wildfire risk throughout California. Wildfire risk reduction is the result of the combined work of entire communities, neighborhoods, and individuals to take those actions that are really necessary to make us um, safer. And it's critical for insurance availability, affordability, and reliability. Insurance has historically been about pricing risk and being a source of resilience um, after a devastating wildfire. And what we're trying to do at the department now is, is to take specific actions so that insurance can incentivize risk reduction before the disaster occurs, thereby saving lives, reducing losses, and, and ultimately bringing down costs. The Safer from Wildfires program was launched in 2021 by Commissioner Lara. We convened the major wildfire preparedness agencies, which included the Governor's Office of Emergency Services, the Governor's Office of Planning Research, the California Public Utilities Commission, and CAL FIRE. And over a year, these agencies met with research experts from the Institute for Business and Home Safety, the University of California, several consumer groups, uh, insurance trade associations, fire, chief, um, fire chiefs, and wildfire safety experts. And our goal was to establish a list of home hardening and community mitigation actions that were based in fire science. To understand the effectiveness of certain strategies to reduce the risk of loss to homes and businesses, we met with these research, um, these risk, research, risk researchers, excuse me. Um, so the Institute for Business and Home Safety is a research organization that tests home hardening strategies and determines those that are most effective to reduce losses to structures. And you've seen a couple of videos today already highlighting those kinds of actions. Um, the University of California has researchers across the state that are studying wildfire risk to communities and are, are developing strategies that can help bring down that risk. In early 2022, the partner agencies announced the Safer from Wildfires program a consensus of best available science around core home hardening actions and community mitigation decisions and designations. And these actions have to be clear and consistent and effective and achievable. So the actions recognize that we need structure hardening. We need to work outward from that structure to the surrounding property. And we also need to focus on the communities. And this goes back to those three concentric circles that Chief Berlant showed at the very beginning of the, of the presentation. Um, so starting with the structure itself, we identified six actions in Safer from Wildfire um, to be taken. So there's a uh, class A fire rated roof, five foot ember resistant zone around the structure, non-combustible six inches at the bottom of walls, ember and fire resistant vents, double pane windows or added shutters and enclosed eaves. And some of these actions like replacing vents can be relatively economical and can be accomplished rather quickly. Other actions will take longer. 
the key here for us is, is for consumers to just get started. Um, we just need to, we need to start somewhere. Um, so many local fire chiefs and local fire districts are providing really important coordination and support for homeowners and business owners and Cal Fire and Cal OESR as well with different grant programs. Um, moving outward from the structure into the area immediately surrounding, there are three actions that were identified. Um, clearing vegetation and debris from under decks, moving sheds and outbuildings at least 30 feet away, and trimming trees and removing brush in compliance with state and local defensible space laws. And finally, moving from the individual parcel level to risk mitigation for the, for the entire community, there are two community level designations that are recognized in Safer from Wildfire. The first is um, neighborhoods can form a FireWise USA community. And the second is that cities, counties, and local districts can become certified as fire risk reduction communities. And this is a designation established in state law and implemented by the California Board of Forestry and Fire Protection. So once we had this uh, framework in place, our next step under the leadership of Commissioner Lara was to make Safer from Wildfires um, impactful for insurance consumers and for the public. In 2022, Commissioner Lara, under his authority as California's insurance commissioner, finalized the first ever regulations by any US state to require insurance companies to provide incentives to policyholders who take these home, business, and community hardening actions. The process for developing these regulations included public workshops, and it incorporated the Safer from Wildfires framework. In addition to recognizing wildfire mitigation actions, the regulation also requires insurance companies to provide consumers with their property's risk score and a right to appeal that score. The regulations were finalized in October of 2022, and insurance companies had to file new rate filings by April of 2023 in order to comply with those new rules. The rules state that insurance companies must incentivize risk reduction for each and every action on this list. That means that the more work you do, the more you can save. This will be an ongoing incentive to harden homes and businesses and to invest further in community risk reduction across the state. Uh, this regulation is, is really just one step in what's been a multi-year effort to encourage home hardening. In 2018, only 7% of policyholders in the state had access to home hardening incentives. By 2021, that number had grown to 40%, and under the new wildfire regulation, um, the, we were be ensuring that 100% of policyholders have access to incentives. A key here is that the home business and community hardening actions contained in the regulations are consistent across insurance companies. This should give consumers the confidence that their investments in risk reduction will be rewarded. Every insurance company writing residential or commercial coverage is required to provide these incentives. So again, the more work you do, the more you can save on insurance. Companies will be competing for the business of Californians and that includes how the insurance companies incorporate risk mitigation incentives. The, the important thing here is to encourage homeowners and businesses to get started with what's achievable today and then to work from there. So how do you access these incentives? The first step is simply to talk with your insurance company. Um, we have an outreach and education team at the department that works with communities across the state to assist consumers with questions on this issue specifically. Um, I also wanna emphasize the multi-agency effort towards wildfire risk reduction and its alignment with Safer from Wildfires. Insurance pricing will be one incentive, but there are also state grants and local grants and other opportunities that can really help neighborhoods and homeowners achieve the actions that are included in the Safer from Wildfire framework. Many of you live in wildfire prone communities and you're seeing both the wildfire risks and the risk reduction actions firsthand. Some of these actions are, are not new, but what is new is these regulations are prioritizing and increasing adoption of actions that can save lives and property. Um, I did just wanna note very briefly, um, prescribed burn has come up a couple of times in the presentations. And um, one of the things that we noted in um, our work on risk reduction is again this, this 
important benefit that uh, prescribed burn provides in reducing risk. So we, together with CAL FIRE uh, last year, created a prescribed burn claims fund um, that, that provides essentially insurance to anyone who is um, conducting prescribed burn. And so I would suggest that you, that you take a look into that because it is another opportunity to reduce that at the community level, um, reduce your risk um, and, and protect yourselves. With that, I will um, turn this back to Frank and appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up, uh, we have uh, Karen Collins with the American Property Casualty Insurance Association. Karen serves as the Vice President of Property Environmental Policy for the uh, American Property Casualty Insurance Association, APCIA. APCIA is the primary national trade association for home, auto, and business insurers with membership that writes over 60% of the property and casualty insurance in the United States. Karen provides thought leadership and policy expertise on property and natural catastrophe issues with emphasis on risk mitigation and resilience and post-disaster response. Karen? Thank you, Frank. So across the US, we are facing growing risk from extreme climate and weather events, which poses a very critical long-term problem that's gonna impact insurance affordability. In this chart, you can see since 2020 that U.S. insurers have incurred nearly $382 billion in losses from natural catastrophes, becoming the costliest four-year period ever for U.S. insurers. And this is adjusted to current 2023 dollars. Though we're seeing growing cost pressures and challenges stemming from both weather-related losses as well as man-made issues. The primary cost drivers for increasing natural catastrophes are the increase in exposure values in high climate risk areas and the increased inflation in the cost of building uh, replacement costs and other insurance inputs. We know that climate change and natural weather variability are additional secondary factors and also legal system abuse and excessive and increasing regulation are also driving up insurance prices for consumers in a number of areas. Um, here you can see since the COVID-19 pandemic specifically, the cost to reconstruct and repair property has surged. Trade services or labor is up 40%, while materials are up nearly 33%. And separately, the cost of rentals and home furnishings are also up over 20%. But it's the growth in asset values when coupled with intensifying climate conditions, as we've heard, that are more conducive to fire ignitions and spread are really leading to much larger and costlier wildfires. The result is seven of the top 10 costliest insured wildfires in the world have actually occurred in California just between 2017 and 2021, or in 2021. And what you'll also see is that we're breaking records for acreage burned. Now we've been fortunate to have significant rain in the last year or so, but this is resulting in more vegetation growth that will become fuel. We know that one spark on a red flag day can result in this list growing. But these issues are not isolated to California as we're seeing a growing number of utility involved ignitions across a number of Western states during these high wind events, which are resulting in some of the costliest and deadliest losses in history. The most recent example being the tragic wildfires in Maui. Here in this chart, you will see that global wildfire losses in the last decade were actually more than five times higher than prior decades again, largely driven by the wildfires here in California. We have a problem. So how do we address these growing losses and the associated costs? We must bend down the loss curve. Now, several today have mentioned IBHS, which is known as the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety. For those not familiar, they are a nonprofit research facility that's actually funded by the insurance industry to help develop scientifically proven standards that enable homes and businesses to withstand increasingly severe weather. In the chart on the left, you can see the new IBHS Wildfire Prepared Home Program. There are key elements to that. This includes, as mentioned earlier, establishing a critical five-foot ignition-resistant zone through fire-resistant materials and defensible space. The items in brown are viewed as critical actions to reduce risk, while the items in blue provide another layer of protection. 
Now, to help illustrate the value of mitigation on the right, you can see the Red Roof House, or Miracle House, as others have called it, as it's one of the few homes that survived the recent Maui wildfire. Now, this is a historic home that had a restoration project completed in 2022. According to the owners, they removed five layers of asphalt that were on the roof and installed a commercial grade corrugated metal roof that included an air pot to allow heat to dissipate. And at the ground level, they removed all vegetation along the home's drip line and added a stone buffer, a step taken to thwart not fires, but termites. Now, while these strategies were not intended for wildfire mitigation, they were actually consistent with the strategies to reduce uh, ignition exposure. They were ultimately consistent with the work of IBHS to create an ignition resistant zone around that home. And the result is the only damage that was sustained was a warp PVC pipe on a wall and paint blistered uh, by intense heat on a wall near the kitchen itself. So working with IBHS, as others have mentioned, the town of Paradise is now rebuilding their community to a higher building and defensible state space standard. On June 20, 2020, June 22nd of 2022, that's a tongue twister, uh, a home in paradise actually became the first home in the country to receive the new IBHS wildfire prepared home designation. And just seven months later in January of 2023, a home in Chino Hills was the first to receive the new IBHS Wildfire Prepared Home Plus designation, designation, which does include additional mitigation actions such as enclosed eaves, covered gutters, upgraded windows and doors, and non-combustible siding. So to help drive actions such as this, there's a number of ways that we can work together to incentivize resilience. As was mentioned, California was the first to require insurance incentives for wildfire specific mitigation efforts, among a number of other actions. It's really critical to understand that we must employ a holistic strategy of incentives. And we have seen other states also incentivize resilience through many of the approaches that I've identified here. As an example, the IBHS Fortified program has been in place for many years in coastal states. This program emerged following the 2004 and 2005 hurricane seasons when seven hurricanes made landfall in the US, including Hurricane Katrina, which became the costliest insured loss event in history globally and remains that today. Many states in that region did experience a difficult insurance market in the immediate years that followed. Though to help reduce losses, many states now provide uh, financial incentives that are directly tied to the fortified program or are based on mitigation actions consistent with the fortified standard itself, which has been scientifically shown to help reduce risk of loss from wind specifically, including up to a category five hurricane. Alabama currently has over 30,000 fortified des designations, the highest number by far of states and is also recognized for having lower insurance premiums than neighboring coastal states. But it's important to understand that the program wasn't stood up overnight. It took several years to roll out the program and collect adequate data on the performance of the program to provide greater confidence in the value of those mitigation actions. What that means is it was an iterative process. And now, many years later, some insurers offer discounts for the fortified designation that can actually be as high as 55% on the wind portion of their insurance policy. So in the wildfire space, we are at the ground floor in standing up a similar resilience program. California was the first to pass a law requiring insurance incentives, and we have seen a couple other states follow suit. What's critical to understand is that the science clearly shows wildfire mitigation requires a set of actions taken together to meaningfully reduce risk. Also unique to the wildfire peril, is that among these actions, defensible space must be an ongoing effort. And also these actions must be done at community scale. Now this is very different than other perils like wind or flood or tornadoes. And as a result poses some unique challenges for insurers and how they must verify wildfire mitigation to in turn provide an appropriate risk-based discount. So this is a challenge many in our industry are currently working on 
And to be transparent, it will take some time. But insurers are fully committed to these efforts, and we are working closely with every stakeholder to help protect families and communities and to improve the affordability and the availability of insurance. So I'm going to next turn it over to the next speaker who will share some insight on some of the work that is being done in this space to achieve that. Frank. Next, we have Nancy Watkins. Nancy uh, is a principal and consulting actuary with Milliman, uh, the San Francisco office. Uh, she leads the Global Milliman Climate Resilience Initiative. Uh, she's also widely recognized uh, as an innovator in wildfire risk. Nancy and her team provide state-of-the-art tools, technology, and analysis to insurers. And additionally, the, the, the skills are shared for reinsurers, government entities, and trade groups. As a thought leader, she frequently testifies and speaks on issues of property insurance availability and affordability. Nancy represented the insurance industry on the California Office of the State Fire Marshal Risk Modeling Advisory Work Group of the Wildfire Mitigation Advisory Committee. Nancy? Thanks, Frank, and uh, thank you, Chief Berlant, and all the meeting organizers for inviting me here. Today, I'd like to share some information about work that we're doing to help with mitigation alignment and focus on the role of wildfire risk models. Um, first, I'd like to reiterate um, with all the people in the room today and all the people I've, I've interacted with in California, we all want the same thing. We want the risk to be reduced in our communities and we want widely available insurance that consumers can afford. So the, the, to understand availability, first you have to understand that it's predicated on insurers being able to manage and measure the risk. Wildfire catastrophe models and risk scores are essential for insurers to understand the risk. And without them, we'd likely have no insurance for wildfire. This would be similar to kind of how private flood has been for many years. But wildfire risk is very difficult to model and may be the least understood peril today for homeowners insurers. Um, one of the things I'd like to point out is the term is wildfires used widely, and that's what I'm going to use today. But we need to distinguish urban conflagration as the real problem with insurance today, when fire is spreading beyond its natural barriers into the built environment. And with those kinds of fires, which you've heard today, um, they're often human caused. They are um, often uh, changed by humans, like fire suppression can change the path of a wildfire or even put it out. This is not true for, for a, a hurricane or an earthquake. Um, the fires uh, can be fueled by houses, and that's very, very different than what you would see for flood or hurricane or earthquake. The, the, the risk is changing very fast. Uh, Chief Berlant went into some reasons, climate, development, and, and vegetation being a major issue that changes from year to year. Um, there's also not enough urban conflagrations to have a lot of data to calibrate our models. So if the insurers and reinsurers are uh, reliant on the models to, to make uh, the bets, um, but they are not as confident because the models need more time to insure, uh, to, to converge, they tend to be more conservative with capacity allocation and underwriting and pricing. So the availability issue is not just because the risk is high, it's because we need better risk understanding to change insurer behavior. The second condition of availability is that insurers can charge the prices that reflect the cost of risk transfer. And as we've heard today, in order to charge risk-based premium and have them be affordable, we need to take effective action to reduce the underlying risk and let that reduce future premiums. But modeling the impact of those actions is even harder than modeling the current state. So I guess what I'd say, it's, it is the, the desired future state, but it's easier said than done. So that's really because you need to estimate the impact of hypothetical risk reductions that could vary very, really widely in different combinations or in different locations. Um, much of the data to verify or evaluate those mitigations is not consistently available. And the risk models as they exist now may not have been designed to incorporate that data in a realistic way. So what I've been working on and what I wanna to talk to you about today is how to address that issue directly. How do we close the gap between effective actions by communities and homeowners and what's visible and usable by insurers and cap modelers? 
We started working on this, Chiefs uh, Freeval and Winokur and I, a couple of years ago, and we convened uh, what we called the Wildfire Knowledge Alignment Work Group at um, Hoover Institute in Stanford in September of 2022. We had about 20 people from CDI, um, IBHS, CAP modelers, actuaries, um, fire service professionals, and our goal for the day, we met all day long, and, and the goal was to better understand the gaps in the current data and science and identify ways to connect the dots between reality and CAT models. We identified five barriers towards the goal, and this is just us talking all day long. Um, first, there was no common standard for mitigation, especially at the community level. Second, there was no way to manage or collect property level mitigation data at scale. Third, the structure to structure spread as opposed to fire spread in, in the vegetative environment didn't, um, it wasn't well understood. So the models had a hard time with, with buildings as a fuel type. Uh, fourth, there was no way to measure the firefighting response effectiveness in changing fire outcomes. And fifth, there's social resistance to implementation and maintenance of mitigation that has to be treated separately from just models. So we identified five work streams to, and, and measurable progress towards all of those has been made towards these goals. We met again in uh, September, uh, actually August of 2023 um, with a, a, a new group um, from CAL FIRE, um, federal government agencies, uh, trade groups for builders, realtors, and the insurance industry, um, and IBHS as well. And we outlined a proposed system to affect community mitigation at scale, and it has three parts. First, we're aligning multiple stakeholders. We're all singing off the same playbook. Uh, it's not singing, it's, it's reading off, I guess. Um, second, we're taking action that is not just uh, it, it quantitative, it's, it's effective to disrupt fire pathways in the WUI. Uh, fire pathways being different for vegetation to vegetation, vegetation to structure, and structure to structure. And third, we're going to facilitate the recognition of these resilience actions. We want the actions to be measurable, visible, and classifiable. All of these are needed. None of these are present now. And with respect to visibility, we need to go two ways, where the insurers have visibility of what's been done and the community has visibility of what they've done and what they should do. So these are all the entities that uh, have, have backed um, formally uh, these, uh, this, this system and we're hoping this slide will get bigger and bigger. The rest of my presentation, I wanna talk about some of the initiatives that are gonna help achieve these goals. Um, first, we are uh, mapping fire pathways into the community to focus on the types of fires that move fast and overwhelm fire response, as Chief Winokur mentioned earlier in his presentation. The high wind days that, with the embers that are spreading miles ahead into the built environment, this kind of mapping is useful to insurers and communities for understanding which areas within a community are most at risk and evaluating the relative effectiveness of various mitigation actions outside the community to slow or halt fire spread. We're also uh, working, uh, Colorado State specifically, is working on structure to structure spread modeling. Once fire gets into the community, helping to predict how fire is likely to move and how long it will take to move from structure to structure um, to help evaluate mitigations inside the communities to change outcomes. Third, we are working with IBHS on a pilot for something called the Wildfire Mitigation Open Data Commons. That's a mouthful. But the whole point is to, to, to put mitigation information into one place. Insurers have to be able to verify mitigations in order to evaluate them and to give any kind of uh, premium differential or underwriting differential. But if you have someone coming out to your house over and over again, that drives up the cost. And a lot of these mitigations have to be verified in an in-person inspection. Technology does exist to allow inspections to be done um, in a more automated way. But if, if other entities like CAL FIRE or community groups or even policyholders themselves, if those are done, they need to be standardized in order for them to be repurposed for um, multiple insurers to quote a policy or for, um, for your current insurer to be able to verify that, that you've done the mitigation that you've said you've done. 
So it's also important for um, not only to know the, the mitigation on the parcel that you're evaluating as an insurer, but the community level risk that uh, Chief Winokur mentioned due to conditions that are, pres that, are, that are in place on surrounding parcels. So for insurers, inspecting one home doesn't provide full information about current conditions for that parcel's risk. Collective action at community scale is going to be required in order to be truly effective. Also, policyholders need transparency of their inspection results, both at the home and the community level. If they knew, if they had access to their own inspection results, they would have a lot of information about um, who had looked at their home, what was the outcome, and that will, I think, uh, go a long way to bridge the gap between the complexity of catastrophe models and the conditions that people can individually impact. So our pilot with IBHS is in its first phase. We've created a sample data set based on the wildfire prepared home standard, very, very similar to the uh, safer from wildfire framework that, uh, that uh, Deborah Halberstadt just presented to us. We're conducting individual interviews with key potential users and contributors of parcel level mitigation data which includes CDI, five of the top 10 California insurers, major reinsurers and cap modelers. And we're asking, what do they need in order to have more confidence in risk modeling, underwriting and pricing, including community as well as parcel level mitigations? We're gonna be wrapping this up in the next month. And then we're hoping that in the future, we will have future steps to build out this data commons with the partnerships of many other um, of the organizations we want to align with. We're working on another pilot with the Western Fire Chiefs Association to create a WUI fire protection score, which will measure the cap capacity and cap capability of each fire battalion in the West to prevent urban conflagrations, taking to account not only the local capacity, but their mutual aid agreements and how far apart the battalions are. We've already built the score and collected it for Contra Costa County. And once again, we're conducting interviews with cap modelers, insurers, and reinsurers and saying, if you had this data, would you consider this as a way of understanding fire spread and fire risk? We're doing a pilot with Ranch and Mission Viejo to bring this all together. All these different steps that we're talking about, showing what mitigation looks like at the community level, parcel level, um, community mitigation, this, this pilot is going to be uh, publicly available and it should demonstrate the concept of how objective measurement can be used to demonstrate impactful risk differentiation for a community and hope to uh, create new classifications that insurers and communities can rely on together. So how do we navigate forward? I hope we can break out of the cycle of applying outdated procedures and catch up to wildfire risk as it stands and then get out ahead of it. We're gonna need expanded use of models and better modeling to understand where to target our resources. This obviously will require aligned stakeholder groups that work toward a, towards a holistic solution. If we succeed, what communities will get is the ability to achieve real risk reduction, the ability to understand insurance decision-making, increased control over their outcomes, a knowledge of how to prioritize their efforts, the ability to confidently communicate mitigation needs, and how communities can monitor their activities with reduced cost. I welcome everyone's feedback and questions and would be happy to follow up individually if you want to participate. Thank you. All right, next we have Janet Ruiz, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, she's the California Director of Communications for the Insurance Information Institute. Uh, I serves, uh, provides unique data-driven insight in, uh, to educate, elevate, and connect consumers, industry professionals, public policymakers, and media. Thank you for inviting me today. We've heard a lot of great information and detailed uh, information good news on wildfire mitigation and alignment and the work that's been done and the progress we're making in the state of California. It's truly amazing. So what I wanted to present to you today is some messaging that you can take forward, boiled down a little bit from all the 
detailed information that we have when you're presenting to your communities. So the state of homeowners insurance, it is a marketplace under pressure. Uh, we have had significant turbulence and it impacted the cost and availability of insurance in cap prone markets, such as California's with our wildfires. Uh, this winter, we're seeing a lot of flood risk, et cetera. Reinsurance costs have been elevated due to increased risk and loss costs, and insurers are paying more for less coverage with tighter terms. The bottom line, insurers have reduced some of their exposure to maintain solvency. Inflation, we've talked about, is a key driver of rate increases. We have rising extreme weather, cat losses, population shifts into disaster-prone areas, and increasing home repair and rebuilding costs. So what are the consumer impacts? Well, some people are getting non-renewals and it's scary to be non-renewed when you get that letter in the mail. But if one company can't uh, continue to insure you, there may be other companies that can. So we always recommend that you shop with a local broker who knows your marketplace and can help you find an insurance company. And if there isn't one available right at that time, the California Fair Plan is the insurer of last resort and does make insurance available to all Californians. The other consumer impact has been under insurance. Now more than ever, it's really critical to update your insurance. Cost to rebuild has increased. Uh, building code upgrades, as we've heard, are uh, much better now. And extended replacement cost coverage is available. So do an annual insurance checkup with your agent. Update your policy after remodels for home improvements. Ask if your policy has coverages for uh, the key things to prevent underinsurance. And the three um, or four coverages that are so important are extended replacement cost, building code upgrade, annual inflation adjustment, and consider increasing additional living expense coverage. Be sure your policy reflects the correct square footage, number of bedrooms, bathrooms, doors, windows. Make sure your policy reflects your home's finishes like granite countertops or hardwood floors. Renters need property insurance too. Consider bundling renters insurance and your auto coverage with the same carrier. Add comprehensive coverage to your auto policy to protect a car in a wildfire. And as I mentioned before, this year we're seeing that in the flood issues that we're having in California. So what does the future of insurance look like? Successful outcomes. We're hearing today about the IBHS, Wildfire Prepared Homes, and the Safer from Wildfire Program, the Firewise USA Program, Fire Safe Councils. Grant programs are available to mitigate homes in communities and new technologies to model risks. Socializing mitigation and preparation. We are taking a predict and prevent focus. We used to more be more react and recover, but now we're looking at how can we predict where these losses will be. We heard about the pathways program today and preventing. We're hearing about science-based mitigation that really will keep your home from burning. Work with all stakeholders to lower risk through mitigation. You're seeing today that we're all talking to each other and working together to help you to mitigate risk. Promote adoption of aligned mitigation standards. That's what this webinar today is all about. We're aligning, we're giving the same message so that we can help our communities be resilient. Where to get information? Uh, I've listed several uh, websites. The wildfireprepared.org talks about the wildfire prepared home. Uh, APCI has a wildfire program. Uh, we have Triple I, a predict and prevent podcast series. 
uh, Safer from Wildfire on the CDI website is excellent. Readyforwildfire.org, Firewise USA, and the Cal Fire Safe Council uh, website. All wonderful um, sites that have so much information that can really help you gain an understanding in your communities that you represent so that people have the tools and the knowledge that they need to be safer from wildfire and to mitigate the loss of wildfire. Thanks so much. Well, first I wanna thank all the panelists. Um, as you may have guessed out there, we, we do spend some time together um, on these same topics. But I appreciate you sharing today as you did and all of the work that you do um, away from days like today. Uh, it's It matters. And I think people can hear the, the cohesive message we're trying to send to you. Um, we're going to uh, start taking some questions here in just a few minutes. Um, so I'll be working with some staff here and we'll be uh, uh, looking at your questions. They come in on the chat and try to respond to those. And then we should have a period where we can um, open, open up the mics um, if you feel more comfortable asking your question directly. Um, I would like to, uh, Kara, can you put that photo up? At the beginning, I mentioned that we've solved wicked fire problems in, in, in my professional lifetime. That's kind of a long lifetime, but uh, we, we've done that. You may have seen this picture. If you've not, check the news. This is uh, a little small area. I think it's called Botania down in Chile. Uh, as you may or may not know, there were a series of very significant wildfires there um, over the last week or so. Um, that's not an accident that community survived. Uh, it's an excellent article. They had a, a fire nearby that community a few years ago. And um, I'm paraphrasing here, but one of the, one of the uh, uh, people that lived there said essentially we couldn't remain spectators and they didn't have any special skills but they started getting to work on what they could do for wildfire mitigation and so it just shows that we can actually bend down the risk as so many uh, of the panelists were sharing today this can be done so panelists uh, get your mouthpieces in we're going to start answering some questions all right Kara, I don't see any up here just yet. Uh, I can't imagine this particular crowd's bashable. So uh, start start getting those questions out there. You've got some great panelists here to answer some answer some questions. Um, there are. Oh. Uh, I'm not a person who's never here. So what I'll do is I'll read them out. Very good. So the first question is, what if a homeowner does not want to conform with the zero to five foot rule? What if the homeowner does not want to comply with the zero to five foot rule? There's probably two parts to that question. Um, I'll answer it from a social perspective, uh, and then I'll turn to Chief Winokur uh, for a more local government response. When we have, what we're responding to is conflagration levels of loss. And that means that our homes are becoming the primary fuel type for fire spread in the community. Um, if I were living, uh, you know, hundreds of yards away from my neighbors, how I prepare my house for wildfire is, you know, largely that consequence is, is limited to me. But in these areas of high density, uh, what I do or fail to do has direct uh, uh, consequence to my neighbors. And so it's not just ourselves we're making a decision for, we're making that decision uh, for our neighbors as well. Chief. I'd say in answer to that question that we, we recognize that living in proximity to others in an urban or suburban environment involves a many number of compromises to include doing things like inconveniencing our travel time to an appointment or errand by stopping at a stoplight or a stop sign so that others can travel. And we, we compromise our desires, our needs, our freedoms with others so that we can all coexist in a relatively tight space. Zone zero and the associated survivability of your structure and the degree to which your structure is likely to propagate fire to ignite your neighbor's structure or to close the evacuation route that your neighbors rely on to remove themselves from the community in the face of a fast moving fire 
That's part of that series of compromises. As many people have discussed, the science is crystal clear. Combustible, combustible material within five feet of a structure is incompatible with fire safety and fire adaptation. And the structure is both the asset and the peril. It is capable of receiving fire and propagating fire. And when homes are not mitigated, they will spread fire to other homes. And, and what is particularly troublesome about that is 7A, ember resistant constructive, construction, defensible space. All of those are engineered to protect a home from wildfire. Every engineered solution has design limitations. And an adjacent igni involved ignited free burning structure will overwhelm the engineered solutions that we put in place to prevent our homes from being susceptible to wildfire. And so all of this work could have been done by the neighbors and but for the lack of mitigations at that home and the unwillingness to remove combustible material within five feet, low cost, high impact, clearly backed by science, could cause a structure to structure chain of ignition that could lead to conflagration and significant losses. And so the question I would ask uh, is, is why not? And what is it about that five feet of combustible material that is so important that you are willing to risk the community's fire safety and increase its exposure to wildfire loss? Oh, very good. This was, this was coming in the email. Forgot to bring my phone. Right. Next question. This is for Deborah. We live in a community where the homes are less than 30 feet apart. Does this mean that all trees, brushes, vegetation have to be removed? We're in a very we are in a very high fire severity zone. We can we can have some other people answer. Yeah, I think this is probably um, actually a better question for the fire chiefs than for the Department of Insurance. Um, so I actually am going to turn this over to uh, Chief Perlings. Let me um, first just um, clarify and remind, at least for the state requirements, because remember, local uh, ordinance can always be more stringent. The state ordinance is not a removal of all vegetation. While we're talking about no flammable items or no vegetation in the first five feet, the remaining 100 feet of defensible space that's required in the state responsibility area and in the very high fire hazard severity zones of locals uh, is the removal of any dead or dying vegetation. So those may be dead leaves or pine needles that have accumulated on your roof, uh, die, dead grass, uh, annual grasses, but is not a requirement of removing all vegetation. And so what I think I hear in, in this question is if you're in a higher density uh, neighborhood where you're closer together, again, it's not an outright ban on all plants. We are very focused as Chief Winokur just talked about on those first five feet as a new requirement um, but again, uh, don't mistake that defensible space is not the removal of all vegetation. It's just, just dead or dying vegetation with advice and suggestions of removing other flammable uh, vegetation and other things that you may consider um, removing. And again, this all caveated with, with whatever your local ordinance uh, may add on uh, in addition to it. All right, our next question, I think... I think this one is going to go to Nancy. Is there an anticipated timeline on the pilot, well, it may not be pilot, pilot financial assistance program? It may not be. That was the pilot. It may be, yeah, it may actually be yours. Yeah, I'm sorry. That was. It's a, it's a good question. Um, the, the financial assistance retrofitting program is our home hardening uh, program. And while we have spent several years uh, um, admittedly developing um, the program, the, the huge uh, challenge, um, but benefit to the state is we're working to leverage uh, federal uh, hazard mitigation dollars. And there are a lot of challenges, just to be frank with you, uh, in, in, in being able to access those dollars for really a, a project that has never been done or never been used with that funding type. So there are environmental laws and some other uh, required analysis that have to be done. With all that said, we are anticipating that our first uh, homes will receive 
the uh, financial assistance and, and actually be retrofitted uh, this coming year. Uh, and again, it's important to note that the reason it's a pilot is for the state to learn what are the challenges in doing this work so that we can report back to the legislature and try to overcome those barriers, uh, but also try to continue to uh, expand uh, or provide assistance to those uh, who are most vulnerable who need uh, this type of uh, project. So that was a very long way of saying, hopefully later this year. Very good. Um, and I just do want to reinforce, we think the Arm V pilot, that's what I queued on in the in the question, we think that's going to be done for release second quarter. Very good. All right. Next question, where can we find more information on the fire safe certified cities? I'm thinking that may be the uh, one of the two community level um, recognitions, yeah. Sure, I'll, I'll uh, jump back in. That is under the California Board of Forestry and Fire Protection. So if you go to um, or just Google California Board of Fire Forestry and Fire Protection, the community uh, wildfire risk reduction list uh, is currently open. And so cities, uh, fire districts, uh, counties currently um, can submit, I believe it's through uh, uh, through April. Um, all of the required um, documents. I don't have the full list, but they are things like uh, you have to have a uh, up-to-date safety element. You have to show that you are uh, in compliance with ordinances that meet or exceed um, the board's fire safe uh, regulations, defensible space ordinances. But to get on that community risk reduction list, the board is currently accepting applications through April. Again, I would Google the California Board of Forestry and Fire Protection. And, and on the outside chance, that question also included uh, what community level program recognitions. I think that's a uh, that's an item that's on the CDI website now. The um, Safer from Wildfires, uh, the community um, version of that. I'm sure this one goes to Chief Winokur. How do you determine which pathways to map? What is the methodology? So there's a number of different ways of looking at wildfire. One is a forestry centric uh, intensity based. Is fire going to burn hot or is it going to be a low intensity ground fire? Um, for forestry management, I think that's a, that's a very, it's a proven, it's established, it's a good technique. If the goal is to preserve merchantable timber and protect uh, forested landscapes and ecosystems. When it comes to the WUI problem, the movement of fire from vegetation into the built environment where structure to structure fire can be supported the intensity is not nearly as important as the speed, and it's the speed relative to the weight of the response. So will there be more fire in any particular area? Then there are firefighters at a given time. And there's a reason that CAL FIRE maintains multiple lists of large fires. There's largest fires by acres, there's most number of structures destroyed, and most number of lives lost. And by and large, the fires that are included on the lives lost and the most number of structures are not the largest fires. A large, slow-moving fire is unlikely to transition into conflagration because there will be an appropriate number of firefighters there to carry out some pre-fire actions and to use offensive and defensive in, in maneuvers to prevent the fire from becoming established in the built environment. So the question is one of relative speed. Will the fire move into the, in, off the landscape into the community before the firefighting response is, appropriate, is, is present with the appropriate weight? Uh, this is simply a question of identifying what is the combination of combustible cells that where topography, fuel, and weather come together to support fast-moving fire, and then looking at that relative to the weight of the available firefighting response, not only from the fire department or district in whose jurisdiction the fire is spreading, but the regional firefighting response, because we don't fight wooey fires department by department. We fight them by region through the use of auto and mutual aid, both those uh, established through local agreements and those organized by the state through the master mutual aid system. So looking at how fire will move quickly and how quickly the firefighting response, putting those two together to understand relative speed and the community's residual risk, which can be bought down through pre-fire actions to cause a fire to move more slowly by addressing the, uh, the nodes most likely to create the edges that will connect to other nodes and allow fire to transmit. Right. This next question, I'm uh, filling in some gaps here. Can sheds 
butted to a home be made fire safe, thus avoiding the required 30 foot separation. Chief Winokur, like a pop tart, is up there. So, so the question having to do with sheds, if it's um, adjacent or connected to the structure, then it's an appurtenance of the structure, and it can be made fire safe by implementing the same environment, the uh, same uh, built environment conditions, such as ember resistant uh, vents, a seven A roof assembly or roof covering, double paned windows, non combustible siding, or at least six inches of separation, and zone zero and the other defensible space measures that would be applied to a structure. So for a shed to be adjacent to a structure or close enough to a structure within 30 feet where it could be the source of ignition, it simply need, needs to meet the same fire safe measures that we would put in place for the structure. If not, it needs to be moved into zone two with the caveat that state fire safe law says a, uh, the defensible space zones extend to 100 feet or the property line and it cannot extend beyond the property line. So moving your shed to zone two on a small property, meaning you are putting it potentially adjacent to your neighbor's home is not solving the problem. It's simply shifting the source of ignition from your shed to your home to now it is your shed to your neighbor's home to your home. So a very short-sighted approach. So it's helpful to look at this from a network effect because that is how the fire is going to spread. And that if you are unable to move the shed to 30 feet from your home or an adjacent home, then the shed should be treated as a structure and defensible space and home hardening measures should be applied as appropriate. Very good, thank you. We are um, at three o'clock, which was um, essentially our time here. So thank you for sticking with us. Um, I'm going to uh, let Chief Berlant close this out. And again, I wanna thank the panelists uh, today for your, your wisdom and your insight and all the work you did over the years getting here and the work I know that we're gonna to do together. Uh, and we certainly thank um, our sponsors and hosts today, Chief Berlant. Great, thank you, um, Frank. And thank you for, for your effort to help convene all of us and, and keep us uh, on task and on time. And again, uh, all of these wonderful presenters, as I mentioned at the beginning, we all have a very uh, diverse background. Um, we have varying responsibilities uh, and requirements, whether at the local level, the state level, uh, or the private sector, um, but we're all working to really try to align this work. A lot of great resources uh, available to you today. I know uh, Kara from our team has uh, dropped a lot of those in the chat. Uh, we'll continue to work with uh, the partner organizations, the rural counties, RCRC, uh, CSAC, uh, and the League to make sure that these resources and this webinar uh, are available uh, to all of you uh, into the future. And for any of your colleagues um, that may have uh, not been able to join us uh, today, we will be posting uh, this presentation uh, online as well. And so we'll share that. So thank you very much uh, for taking the opportunity. Thank you to the panel as well uh, for joining us on this important topic. Uh, and uh, we hope to see you uh, this summer, not at a wildfire, um, but just to continue this conversation of how do we uh, better protect all of our communities uh, in, into the future. So thank you everybody for joining us.